have stopped. And since we start with the festival friends, we decided that maybe it's going to be cool to give an opportunity to people who often talk, but not about themselves, to actually talk about themselves. And we uh, felt that uh, we could try. Well, at least I have a whole uh, uh, list of questions on how to uh, learn English. And um, well, let's just say that we do have lots and lots of time and we decided to hold this moderator's talk. Moderators, linguistic, translational talk. And I'm very happy that thanks to all those years, I try to remember um, based on DocuDays UA, well, it's it's been 10 years. We need to... Uh, we needed to go through all of these processes to um, get into this nice company. Thank you, Katya. My name is Maxim Butkevich. And from time to time, I moderate uh, some screenings at DocuDays and also Q&A sessions. And very often it's happening in English. And uh, sometimes uh, I have to interpret from English into Ukrainian and vice versa. And today, together with uh, Katya Popravka, we will talk about this. But firstly, we need to uh, we needed to these 10 years in order to actually get here um, to be in this company to have these cups of coffee and to have these sweets uh, these are homemade ones and if yesterday you were present at our morning workouts uh, these marshmallows as we were told are very rare so now we have marshmallows and are, it's quite a rare treat and i remember how i uh, um, what difficulties and challenges i had what situations i faced um, uh, and how it happened, what is happening in DocuDays, and how it went on. Uh, yesterday, yes, I thought about it, uh, because uh, with all the festivals in Ukraine, I have an approximately similar story. Uh, something happens which is uh, quite uh, unfathomable, and then I get into the team, and with DocuDays, uh, my story started eight years ago and two or uh, three years for two three years I just translated films and yeah and you see what uh, funny things are happening on the screen and uh, it's been for two three years the first two years I never had a chance to go to the festival itself I had no opportunity to uh, uh, physically attend the festival, but to become a moderator and to interpret at uh, Q&As, to see the audience, uh, well, um, the first uh, location was uh, the um, House of Cinema and the audience there is very different. The atmosphere itself was different. For me, uh, the whole thing started in 2014. Uh, one, one day, uh, the festival team asked me, Katya, would you like to join in? And somehow I got in. For, uh, at first, I was a bit nervous. And uh, now, since I'm often a moderator at uh, Docu World, uh, very often I see familiar faces in the audience, and I know uh, what the que what questions are coming our way, and there is this internal struggle. Uh, oh, I'm asking. Yeah, and I'm asking uh, my interpreters to be understanding because 
it's important. Yeah, uh, it's uh, really great when you see familiar faces in the audience, but sometimes you feel like, oh no, please don't say anything. Please don't say, uh, don't say anything. But, but sometimes people want to take the floor, but as a rule, when I see the people uh, who come uh, year after year, it is so rewarding. It is so great. And, uh, you know, back then, uh, that festival, at uh, that moment, DocuDays UA uh, was uh, a sort of a powerhouse, uh, but post-Maidan festival, maybe uh, someone uh, doesn't know, uh, until the very last moment, the festival team didn't know whether they would manage to uh, carry on, but they still decided uh, to uh, push through. And it was really a breakthrough. It was epic. No sarcasm intended. But there, at this festival and at other festivals, there were some, you know, funny situations. It seems that it was back in 2009 when it was my first time at the festival and uh, uh, my then colleague, uh, my friend who worked with the festival, uh, she invited me um, uh, to moderate a one screening uh, and the, I as an activist was interested in the topic and then it went on from there because I needed to moderate some more uh, films and why not join the program. And somehow I got uh, engulfed uh, in this uh, program and it was huge. Yes, uh, it's really engaging. And when you talk in front of the audience, I worked uh, on TV back then uh, as an international journalist this um, camera fright uh, is familiar to me because uh, when you're uh, live um, in the studio, you understand that at this moment, uh, thousands and thousands of people uh, see you and behind the camera, you see those pairs of eyes and this is paralyzing and you have to somehow... Uh, switch off and not to think about it uh, you also feel it with the guests uh, because they somehow freeze uh, so in my experience when you uh, work uh, in a specific environment but, um, not in front of the camera people are naturals but uh, in front of the camera even if it's re uh, a recording well, people just freeze. But I, as an international journalist, since I worked with English, uh, translation was uh, something new for me. Blog by blog, uh, Q&A interpretations when you see a producer or a director standing next to you and you're asking them those questions and then you interpret them and then you interpret the answers from uh, their answers and then you interpret the questions from the audience, uh, from Ukrainian, from Russian, from English, different languages. And you cannot interpret simultaneously. You have to remember what the, the person's just said. And every year I have this uh, fear that maybe I fail at some point, especially if you are a creative individual, uh, then they hear this question and they can, can stop and you're trying to somehow rein it in. Yeah, I have the same issue. I can't. I don't know how to stop people when the person is in the zone and they're so engaged and you uh, cannot envision what they are going to say. Let's just say not in uh, not uh, festivals, but when I work as an interpreter, there is some uh, aspect of na 
something naive when you're asking, uh, are you going to mention names, specific dates? And they are answering, no, no, I'm just going to say general things. But some things, uh, but then there's a click, there's a switch, and then the person goes into details. And when you're standing there in front of the audience, when you're listening to that person who's talking about something dear to them, and I, I'm i just going like, wow, talk more, 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 and more. And then I think, well, oh no, enough, because I need to interpret that normally, adequately, and to preserve the message. And I often understand that there is a feeling with the audience that they are bored because they know that there's going to be interpretation. And the person going on and on for years. Oh, you do not have a professional interpreter's background, do you? No, I'm not a linguist by, uh, by profession and I'm not a journalist. I'm a philosopher. I have a background in philosophy. Oh yeah, since uh, you are a humanitarian in Ukraine, uh, then the whole world is your oyster. Well, I love philosophy. I've always loved it. In the early 90s, uh, well, the people who wanted uh, to go uh, into philosophy, they just needed a certificate or, well, just wanted to avoid the army. It's just, well, it was like a faculty for the jobless. But my uh, second background is in applied anthropology. Uh, that, that is in. I got it in Britain. It's not language. And you're saying that you don't have a background in translation. I um, have a background in literature studies. Uh, I'm a person who is professionally tasked with telling stories. And um, here I go. Well, there are stories and you can tell them in any way. Uh, but uh, my background is in Ukrainian language and literature. And uh, my, uh, well, um, with me, English was not a specialty. But in my case, English uh, was difficult at first, but then it moved on and on. So... Uh, uh, you see now who interprets uh, Q&As at festivals, philosophers and uh, uh, Ukrainian literature experts. But I'm grateful because every year after every Q&A, with some only rare exceptions, there are people who approach me to just thank for interpretation. And then I give a sigh of relief because... Uh, because um, interpretation uh, requires you to um, just um, ingest everything that you hear. And uh, a person uh, has been talking for uh, two minutes and uh, then you've been talking for f uh, two, uh, almost three minutes. And uh, how did you manage to actually uh, interpret that? And sometimes uh, people just uh, are so fascinated and then sometimes they just interrupt uh, the speakers and ask uh, the interpreter to interpret, to do their thing. Uh, and uh, then uh, sometimes uh, I get asked, how does that happen? Because uh, when I worked on TV, uh, there was uh, such a saying, uh, so that uh, you can't go on air without uh, goofs and fails. So uh, human error is everywhere. And so when you're sitting in DocuDays, same old story, uh, because there were years when uh, I was there in the audience and I was watching and reading uh, uh, movies with subtitles and I was reading those subtitles and there were so many goofs. And uh, I remember there, uh, there was this uh, uh, movie which was literally called The Murder of Minors. There was... Um, 
when the miners in uh, South Africa were executed, and, uh, and there uh, the, the word uh, trade union uh, was uh, uh, translated as uh, uh, the union of traders, and I had to ask, uh, to ask for forgiveness in front of the audience because that was such a uncomfortable situation. And sometimes uh, people ask some trashy or sexist or stereotyped or negative questions or they uh, say something that was difficult. And since I'm an interpreter, I have no right to edit the questions and answers. And these situations, uh, um, well, I don't know how visible they are, but I see those faces. I don't know whether you um, face something like that. Yes, quite often. But I have to acknowledge that I try to improve on that because when you're working as an interpreter, you have this uh, dual role because uh, you're a moderator interpreter. As a moderator, your freedom is limited. You cannot interfere uh, with uh, the conversation like that because uh, your task is to give a push to a person. Uh, but as an interpreter, I'm always thinking about that. When I, when I hear some incongruous things, uh, but with practice, I, it uh, comes now easier to me. But now uh, such words as maybe, possibly, you just add these words and they somehow smooth it out. Because maybe it's not good uh, in professional terms, but I feel more comfortable because I introduce this element of doubt. But I agree with you. Uh, because when a person starts saying something which is uh, absolutely impossible, oh, I, I just start feeling that this is, here it comes. At docu days, uh, there were situations like that. When you interpret consecutively, uh, you have this um, visual contact with a person. And at those moments when a person says something unfath unfathomable, you're trying, I start to s start smiling and the person uh, perceives it as encouragement and they go on and on and on. And uh, you're thinking, oh, get me out of here. Since you mentioned this uh, trade union, this notion of trade union, Uh, for uh, those of you, uh, trade union is a professional union, and uh, a trade union announced the strike. But um, uh, in the subtitles, uh, we uh, saw the union of traders, which meant nothing in that specific context. Well, I remembered one thing. I had one very public uh, t uh, interpretation event. Uh, it was something with uh, uh, Shevchenko's days and there was uh, an American guest about, uh, speaking about Shevchenko in the best possible words. And, uh, oh, we had... And at a certain moment, a point in time, uh, he gives a quote from Shevchenko and says, this is what Shevchenko wrote. And I, everything was fine before that. And then it's my cue and I'm sta standing on stage uh, looking at several hundred people, and I understand that I lost the conversation in turn. Kosher, or what, I'm asking, and, and then my literature studies switch on, and I understand 
casserole yeah uh, to, uh, well maybe something kosher casserole but i am trying to figure out what is what um Actually, I'm thinking that it couldn't be the quote from Shevchenko. Maybe that's uh, the book by Shevchenko. Maybe it's the uh, cops are in his pronunciation. And I'm getting lost and all these processes are going on in my head round, round. And there were uh, some participants. And I understand that it's uh, it's been two seconds since I am started to stall. This is not uh, the advice uh, for interpreters, but I understand that people are waiting for something from me. I'm, I'm starting to paraphrase the sentence that came before uh, very beautifully in a moderate tone. And, and now I know that uh, there's going to be something bad. What is it? And I said, uh, casserole, and well, and I'm, I said it with a lightning speed and people oh, just thought, well, she said something, oh, it's fine. And they didn't pay that much attention. This is not good, but that was a way out. You know, these things happen at uh, different levels. And I met different interpreters in different countries, but I remember from my uh, TV uh, days when we had you know, materials from foreign visits of the then president, and now you understand from, pre uh, from President Kuchma, you understand ancient age. And there were questions that was an official uh, visit and they were discussing the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, they were discussing cutting the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and carbon emissions. And uh, there was this final briefing and the head of the state where President Kuchma went to. And... Uh, the Ukrainian interpreter translated interpreted into Ukrainian, and at one point I understood that uh, she uh, didn't understand the context. And when we came to uh, Kyoto uh, Protocol, uh, she just said Kyoto Protocol. And when we came uh, to CO2, and she just repeated that in English, and someone from the delegates said that in Ukrainian. So it happens when the person doesn't know, doesn't have any specific background, doesn't know, is not aware of the context. Yes, you were aware of um, Shevchenko's works, but that uh, lady interpreter wasn't aware of uh, the topic of climate change. And when I started back then to uh, speak. Um, uh, English, uh, there was uh, a gradual shift because uh, here we have comments from our um, audience and she says, uh, thank you. Um, uh, we uh, knew about Kata's interpretations, Kata's work and your work at DocuDays, English, how it happened the language and interpretation and translation. I loved English since childhood. I didn't understand back then in childhood what it meant, but I think that I was lucky with the professors and tutors. They were great. And somehow I got in. When in uh, first grade, I started learning English. I just uh, devoured uh, textbooks. There was one specific book which was notorious <laughs> back then. And then uh, I had this uh, teeny tiny Chinese uh, radio set. It was 1997-98. Uh, it was so very cool back then. And I remember that uh, on short wavelength, uh, you could uh, listen to the BBC channel. And it was real cool because that was magic for me, the things that they were saying. And there was this um, 
a radio set uh, at my grandma's place. Um, this was the Ukrainian option. And I love this uh, magic of the language. And, but I can't say that I had this uh, specific desire uh, to go into interpretation and translation. It was quite by accident. It happened at a um, film festival, Molodis, when I was a volunteer. It was strange back then. It was my first day as a volunteer. I spent 12 hours in uh, Borisville Airport, and I uh, thought that uh, uh, you have to be very formal and official, wearing high heels when meeting guests. And then I uh, came to the uh, Kiev uh, movie theater. Uh, my shift was ending, and they told me that I had to interpret the presentation of the film. And then uh, they told me that the, uh, the ambassador of Denmark uh, will be present. And I still remember that sheet of paper. The coordinator gave me the sheet of paper with a list of words that they were going to mention. And I remember uh, that question, uh, th that word that uh, they are going to mention, the ambassador extra extraordinary and plenipotentiary. I didn't even know what that meant in Ukrainian, and I didn't know how to say that in English. But that first evening gave uh, was the start. And as for other languages, I'm just like a dog, you know. I understand lots of things, but I will never say in anything. Because when... Um, oh, that's <laughs> quite shameful. Uh, at some point, I started learning French. I still love it. Uh, it's connected with Search Kingsburg. And I just wanted to know how it sounds in the original. And at a certain point, uh, I started learning Italian, but that was just catastrophic because at that point I bought an audio uh, course and uh, at the point I just understood that I was just repeating words. I wasn't uh, learning the language. I just loved the sound. And now I'm learning Norwegian. That's very interesting. Yesterday, uh, we were uh, mailing each other, and uh, one of the events started, happy hours. Um, this is the party at Docu Days together with Quillaway. This is just party, you know, the disco, there are DJs, there is music. And I just love working while listening to that music. And Katja wrote me uh, that it's great to repeat uh, Norwegian words while listening to that music. Yeah, just you have my greatest respect. But you do speak French, don't you? I'm a bit shy about it because... Uh, I do have a certain command of French. I didn't have any formal um, background um, in languages. Well, because Soviet instruction was not up to, up to par, but it somehow happened all by itself but for me english is the joy of understanding but french it's the joy of a sound and with french it was very quick it was because of my personal circumstances because for me uh, that language was quite natural it's mine i do have the, this feeling of ownership and i went to britain to the uk to work at bbc and uh, somehow just um english uh, just came to the fore i understand french and i enjoy watching french films or belgian films at docu days online because uh, they are subtitled 
fortunately, and I enjoy the fact that I understand everything in the original. And for me, subtitles are important because um, Uh, because it was back in 1997, it was in uh, the open cinema, and it was uh, there was the Dead Man by Jarmusch, and it was a uh, English film subtitled into uh, English, so you don't lose the intonations. But in documentaries, it's priceless because when people actually speak. And I think uh, dubbing would really heal, uh, kill a lot of the emotions. So I am really a fan of subtitle transla uh, translations. In Polish, I do just a little bit of a personal communication as well as a little bit of Belarusian. Now I'm more of a, like a dog, I get everything, but I can't speak much. So I really hope to go back to my French sometime, coming back to what to do when you utterly disagree with what a person is saying. Well, personally, I have this thing in my experience that uh, it, it really helped me that I still work in uh, the media as a journalist because uh, according to the standards, you have to refer to the source and you have to separate the facts from your opinion, from your editorial opinion. And then you also have to separate that from the opinion of the, your characters. So if there's something you disagree with, you have to you have to say, as per our highly esteemed speaker, or as according to our participants' opinion, this and that and that. And this separation, give, it's like this person is saying this, and I'm just here to convey this. So you, you had a question. Here's a question. What was your most difficult interpretation experience? Uh, maybe it would be probably interesting to watch a film about, documentary film about the work of interpreters. So what was your most difficult or most trying interpretation experience? I don't, I don't know. I'm going to say that before every public interpretation job, I'm still very nervous. It's very difficult for me to assess what's coming. But the most difficult one, I often have trouble with American accents. I can take a lot of different accents, but sometimes American accents would, I would just be tuning into the accent for the first 15 minutes and going like, what? You know, it's, it's like this Umber, Umberto Eco's joke that I am an English scholar and this is not English. So this was my this was my reaction. But just to to recall one case, likewise for me. But I can I cannot disagree with American accent about the thing with American accents. When I just worked uh, with the BBC, I went to different countries as an international journalist. And in London, I understood that uh, my English does not amount to much, but in the, uh, gl in the global office, the global desk of the BBC, everything was okay because there was a lot of uh, English, uh, different flavors of English. But then when you go outside into, into mo most of Britain, you could, there are so many different types of English according to the school you went to, where you grew up, what social, what walk of life you are. And when I, one of my first reports was uh, in Yorkshire, and uh, I was really amazed at the Yorkish accent, but that was before I met the Scots, but that was before I met the Irish. And at took me a while to get used to British accents, but uh, I never got totally used to them. So that's probably one of my di more difficult experiences was why I started using English that actively. Uh, I, I realized that sometimes uh, I would have to translate what essentially is punk lyrics 
So the uh, so when I was a teenager, I would listen to punk music, and uh, but then I got one of my favorite bands called Clash, and many others. But that's a different thing. I am. I'm. Uh, in, I got into a uh, international activist conference in Geneva in 1998 where uh, this conference which gave birth to what is now known as the anti-globalist movement and with a Russian speaking, uh, we were a Russian speaking group and there was a trans uh, translator, she was young but like I said she uh, the she was out of the context. Uh, all of these uh, general agreement for tariffs and trade, neoliberalism, and this corporate liberalization, that was completely alien to her. She was from a humanitarian background, and we there were two working languages, in English and Spanish. And without quality translation, we realized that we. Uh, were compl we felt excluded, and at a at a certain point, uh, we got invited into a bo uh, a bar with activists uh, in Liverpool. Uh, and after a few points, I uh, said that we felt we felt excluded because of non uh, not high quality translation. So we had a few pints more and then we had a several hour long conversation where I realized that scary as it is, I can speak English. And I started interpreting for our group. So I, it was my first experience. I didn't know how, how fateful that would essentially eventually turn out. And you never know when you start. Uh, we have to wrap up, but actually I'm finally so comfortable that, uh, uh, there's some more time until happy hours, but I'm thinking uh, we talk. We were we were about to talk about the difficulties of translation and how to learn languages. So our our advice would be: listen to the BBC, go to DocuDays UA. You can always listen to us, and you can always correct us, or you can look at our our poker face and something else maybe, and uh, l watch films uh, with closed captions and subtitles. We'll look and listen to what your uh, characters are saying and also talk to native speakers, converse with native speakers. Another secret is when I really learned a lot of English was during one and a half months. Uh, it was with a private teacher who was in the same class as my cousin, and my cousin will now watch this recording from a different country where he now lives. So his friend of my cousin taught me English for uh, one and a half months, and this was during the economic breakdown. Uh, a real uh, so due to the inflation that become became prohibitively expensive. But what he told me. Uh, he said, uh, "Do you need, do you need to have it beautiful, or do you need to have it working?" So you know, if you don't know something, just describe, just reformulate. Uh, your goal is to be understood, and don't be afraid if you don't understand something. Maybe if had he not told me that, I wouldn't have known my English. So just look for detours, look for other ways. And maybe this is where we wrap up. Watch, make sure you watch the films. We have a full program in front of us. And we have the soup with directors and rights now and the docu class. And please vote for films. Uh, participate in the online living library. Uh, some films we will unfortunately not be able to talk to the directors. Uh, because, uh, for example, the Northern Traveler, uh, we uh, the director speaks only Farsi, and it's problematic to ensure translation uh, remotely. I really, 
I, I really enjoy that we've been able to move online, but I also really miss our audience. It's very difficult to talk into the void where you can't see the reaction, but I can feel the reaction. Uh, I will, we will have the soup with directors, and I will be. I hope I'll be able to feel your reaction. So virtually in 15 to 20 minutes, we will have our next event. So please go to docudace.ua and go uh, uh, review the program. Go to docuspace.org. Also, look at the films if you haven't had time uh, to watch uh, docu shorts. There, there is a good, great film uh, which we're going to talk about in 20 minutes. So, thank you very much, Maxim, and thank you very much. Wash your hands, stay at home, and watch docu days and participate in the discussion. Bye. <laughs>